Hello, and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Sarah Ann Minkin, Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is February 16th, 2022, and I am delighted to be here with Dr. Maha Nassar. Maha is an Associate Professor in the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona, and she is a brand new fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Thank you so much for being here, Maha. Thank you. A few words of background before we begin. FMEF has just launched a brand new initiative, a Palestinian non-resident fellowship, through which two Palestinian scholars and advocates will join FMEP in conceptualizing, hosting, and participating in our webinars and podcasts for a year. Our 2022 inaugural fellows are Dr. Maha Nassar and Jihad Abu Salim. This fellowship seeks to help correct a historic pernicious imbalance, the absence of Palestinians from public conversations about their lives, histories, experiences, and future. This absence of Palestinians from public conversation is something that Maha knows about in detail. She wrote a terrific article called US Media Talks a Lot About Palestinians Just Without Palestinians. FMEP is trying to right that wrong. In our public conversations, we try to amplify the voices of Palestinians, and we are so excited to invite these two fellows to join us for 2022 and so honored that they have agreed. So Maha, thank you again. Thank you. And thank you for establishing this fellowship. I think it's a really important step uh, in correcting a lot of those wrongs that you just laid out. Thank you. So let's start with you telling us about your background, about your family, please. Sure. So uh, as you might guess, I'm Palestinian American. Uh, I'm the daughter of Palestinians who were born in Palestine prior to 1948. And so you could say that I am the daughter of Nakba survivors. They were both a children in 1948, both forced to flee from their homes. And like so many Palestinians from that era, spent a lot of time in lots of different places around the world. Uh, my dad's family went to the Gaza Strip. They're from Barbara, which is in Southern Palestine. Uh, they fled on foot to the Gaza Strip where he spent his youth and then as he got older moved to the Gulf and then to Europe and then to Libya. My mother's family is from Yaffa. They also fled in 1948 first to uh, Syria and then to Libya where my mom grew up as well. That's also where they met, um, got married and then came here to the United States. They came as graduate students to the University of Arizona. So I was born in Tucson uh, shortly thereafter, they moved to the Chicago area, and I grew up in the Chicago area, and I spent a lot of time in the southwest suburbs there. That's often referred to as Little Palestine, the area um, in and around Bridgeview. And so growing up, I learned a lot about different ways of being Palestinian. So my mother's family was spread all over the world, uh, in the U.S., in Egypt, in Jordan, and so I would visit them in those different places. My dad's family is primarily still in the Gaza Strip, which we were not allowed to go to. So I haven't had as much contact with them. And then Chicago, the Chicago Palestinian community is largely made up of Palestinians whose families come from the West Bank area. And so through them, I got to learn a lot about uh, what it meant to be from um, rural and semi-rural areas of the West Bank, what it meant to go my friends of mine would go visit their families living under occupation, so they would experience that firsthand. So there were lots of different experiences that I had growing up and lots of different ways I observed of what it meant to be a Palestinian and to be a Palestinian American, be a Palestinian in the US. But at the same time, because I'm growing up in the US, I'm also watching and consuming US media, newspapers, television shows, um, and I remember I was in, in middle school during the first Intifada, and I remember that being a really important turning point in my cognizance of the fact that what I knew about Palestinian realities and lived experiences did not match up with what I was seeing on the screen or reading on the page as they were describing Palestinians and who we are and what we did. And so, so often I found myself stumped, but also kind of fascinated and also kind of angry about how Palestinians were being framed in US media and what I knew firsthand from my own experiences from those of family and friends. 
So that was always something that interested me. And actually, when I started college, I thought that I might want to be a journalist. I thought that that might be one avenue to try to correct uh, and right some of these wrongs. But then I realized, because college is one of those moments where you learn a lot about yourself, I realized I'm pretty introverted. So the idea of walking up to strangers and asking them questions didn't really appeal to me. And I also realized that I wasn't interested in the media in general. I didn't want to go to like the county fair and ask people what they thought or go to a crime scene and ask what was going on. I was really just interested in media depictions of Palestine and the Palestinians. Um, and so I was really interested in how language works and what are, the, what, are the, what are the linguistic tools that people use when talking about other groups of people and ways to elevate them and make them look good and ways to denigrate them and make them look bad. Um, I was the uh, editor of my school paper. I went to a small Islamic high school it was small at the time, called Aqsa School, which was also very um, populated with a lot of Palestinians. And so there was this interest in getting Palestinian stories out there. And I had an interest in how media works, but I didn't want to be a journalist, I realized. Um, so I became an English major instead, which is kind of close. Uh, I went to a small liberal arts college, which didn't have any Middle East studies at the time. Uh, but when I got to graduate school, I realized I really do want to study the Middle East and I want to be the person who is being interviewed, not necessarily the person doing the interviewing. And so I went to the University of Chicago. I got a master's in Middle Eastern studies and a PhD in Near, Near Eastern languages and civilizations, all with a focus on Middle Eastern history, Islamic studies, and what became the core of my research, which is Palestinian history. So I immersed myself in all forms of historical and other humanistic and social science knowledge. Um, I learned Hebrew, which complemented uh, the Arabic that I had already learned. Um, I met my husband in graduate school, which was also a plus, and we got married and he got a job here at the University of Arizona and uh, I got a job a few years later. And so here we are. Wonderful, thank you. And how amazing to return to the school where your parents Right? They did their graduate work. It's a pretty cool circle, yeah. Yeah, the city of your birth. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you more about, um, about your research. So in, in 2017, you published the book uh, Brothers Apart, Palestinian Citizens of Israel and the Arab World, which is wonderful. I haven't finished it, but I have begun it and I'm working my way through and learning so much from it. And I know you're now working on a new book about the people of, of Palestine. So will you tell us about your research and about um, what, what questions are you trying to answer through your work? What questions are animating your research? Great. So I think I'll start by talking a little bit about the background of my first book, which emanated from my dissertation. And that emanated uh, from, of all places, my Hebrew class. So I was taking Hebrew and we were asked to translate an essay by Anton Shamas, who's a Palestinian a uh, citizen of Israel novelist. And in 1988, he wrote an essay called The Morning After. And at the time I was struggling through translating it from Hebrew into English, not realizing it was also published in English. So that was a fun discovery later on. But as I was struggling through the Hebrew, tra translating it from Hebrew to English, this sort of um, I, realization dawned, a couple of realizations dawned on me. So The Morning After was written in it, he asks what happens to the Palestinians living in Israel the morning after a Palestinian state is declared and recognized in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So this is written shortly after the Palestinian Declaration of Independence calling for a Palestinian state in the occupied territories. So he's asking well, what happens to us, those of us who didn't leave our homeland, those of us who've held fast onto our land, are we gonna now be shunted? to this new state that we have no connection to? Are we going to be told you no longer belong here, even though we were, we've always been told that we don't really belong here, what's gonna to happen to us? And so I realized that even though I had grown up become, being familiar with so many different Palestinian experiences and ways of being Palestinian, I knew very, very little about this particular group of Palestinians, those who stayed in their homeland, became Israeli citizens and, and, and stayed. So I became fascinated by them. And I became really interested in their literary output in particular, especially since a lot of the most famous Palestinian poets that we know, people like Mahmoud Darwish, Samih al-Qasim, 
Tofiq Zayed, were all Palestinian citizens of Israel, at least at one point. So I sort of put together my English background and my history background and started going through and pouring through their poetry collections, but also their newspapers and their um, literary journals that were published in Arabic in the 1950s and 60s. And as I was doing so, I realized a few things. One is that I realized that I actually felt a strong sense of connection to them because we were both Palestinian minorities living in a state that was, that was constantly sending messages that we were other, that we were different, that we were hostile. And so this kind of double consciousness that W.E.B. Du Bois talks about where there's a recognition of who we are, but also a keen awareness of how others perceive us was something that I was tracking a lot in, in my research. And also something that made me realize that, oh, we're not, we're not the only ones who face this, those of us in the US. The second thing I realized was that even though they themselves were geographically isolated, so you have to remember in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Israel is, they've signed armistice agreements with the surrounding Arab countries, but they're still in a de facto state of war, sometimes an overt state of war, like in Egypt um, in 56 and 67. So Palestinians who were inside the Green Line couldn't just hop on a plane or hop in a car and go outside of it. They couldn't even go to the West Bank or Gaza. And so they were really geographically isolated. And yet at the same time, as I'm reading these journals and newspapers and so forth, they're very, very connected culturally, intellectually to what's happening in the rest of the Arab world and beyond. And they're very grounded in and identified and they identify with anti-colonial movements, anti-imperial movements, leftist movements, nationalist movements elsewhere. So I came to realize the importance of the written word in establishing that sense of connection when they themselves weren't physically able to go. And then lastly, I realized also as I was doing my research that this kind of cultural and literary engagement with the outside world was seen as a real threat by the Israeli authorities. And even poetry and, po and poets and poetry, which we think of as being sort of highfalutin and spiritual and not really political, played a really important political role for Palestinians and was part of Israel's larger project of cultural colonization. So we talk about Israeli colonization in terms of land, in terms of policies, in terms of things like that, but the attempt to culturally colonize these Palestinians and remove their Palestinianness by referring to them as Israeli Arab, by framing them as a minority, as a happy minority in a multicultural state, but this was very much part and parcel of the larger project of Israeli settler colonialism. And that Palestinians also used culture to push back on this project as well. So the role of culture and the role and the ways in which um, structures of cultural oppression played out is something that also became very clear and ended up, I ended up centering that as I revised my dissertation into a book which became Brothers Apart. Since then, I've been following some of the research threads that have emerged, that emerged as I was working on that first book. One of them is the history of Palestinian engagement with the Black Freedom Movement here in the US and more broadly Black internationalism, which is something that we've heard about recently in terms of recent movement activism around Black Palestinian solidarity, but it has a much, 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 much longer history than I think a lot of people realize. And it's because they understood racism as a structure of oppression and not just, you know, the negative feelings of individuals. And so this idea of recognizing racism as structure is something that a lot of Palestinian intellectuals and Black, especially Black internationalist intellectuals, were very attuned to and I think was a form of um, engagement between them. And then the flip side of that, which you um, also alluded to in that article I wrote about Palestinians in the media. So the flip side of that, and also informed by my research and my background, is trying to dig deeper into the roots of a lot of the anti-Arab racism that we see here in the US. 
and the tropes that are deployed and the ways in which Palestinians are constructed and Arabs and Muslims more broadly are constructed as violent, as threatening, um, and the way that it's done to delegitimize Palestinian political claims. Um, and I've done some research specifically on Exodus, both the novel and the movie, which played a really huge role, I think, in um, perpetuating a lot of these stereotypes, many of which are still with us today. And then finally, my current book project is a global history of Palestine's people that is sort of taking this larger transnational concept that I, that I talk about in my first book and expanding it both in terms of the timeline to look at the pre-modern period, but also to expand it geographically to look not just at um, Palestinians and their engagement with the Arab world, but with the, with the entire world with Latin America, with the US, and especially in the 20th century with the large Palestinian community in the Shatats in, in, in exile. Um, I think this is something that's really exciting. So thinking about Palestine and Palestinians beyond just the geographic area of what we traditionally think of as Palestine and really conceptualizing Palestinians as a global people who are both national and transnational at the same time. That is so exciting all of that. And I just, um, for my for my own sake and for the audience, I want to I want to reflect a little bit of what I just heard, which is which is so much. So you, you're starting with when people can't be in touch with each other, can't see each other, the importance of the written word mm -hmm. and the importance of communication, which feels obviously so important. And you're and you're speaking about a population that was living under a, a, a military a military government at the time, but feels also really relevant for now. And mm -hmm. because, and you can't travel to the Gaza Strip and see your family and um, how we are, how we are able to connect to each other and what are these important points of, of communication. So there's, there's that, there's culture as a site of oppression and also resistance. Mm -hmm. um, there is this recognition of the, the, the structure of racism and racism as, as a structure on which our society is is is, is built and and um, that connects African Americans and Palestinians in an old history and and in the present day, um, and there is the anti Arab racism in our media and in our culture more broadly, and then this larger bigger picture question of Palestinians as a national and a transnational people and thinking about Palestinians around the globe, Palestinians mm -hmm. in exile. Mm -hmm. That is a big agenda and very. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> and very exciting. Um, and I want to ask you to say more, if you will, about especially thinking about this Palestinians as a transnational people and a national people, and and what is who are Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I'm gonna that I know that's a huge question, and we could ask you to to you know give us a course, give us a dissertation, a new book just on that question. But I actually want to ask you a specific question. Um, will you talk a, a little bit about what this moment in time and history means for Palestinians, for Palestine, for Israel? Uh, how would you decide? How would you describe where we are now, please? Sure. So I'm I'm actually quite excited uh, about the present moment. I think that we are at an inflection point where things could go into multiple in a multiplicity of directions. And I say that because I think over the last few years, more and more people here in the United States, which is what I'm most familiar with, but I think also people around the world are becoming more aware of what they didn't know before. And specifically, I'm talking about the ways in which structures of oppression, structures of marginalization, structures of racism play out and how they affect marginalized and oppressed communities. So we saw, for example, in 2020, the huge uprisings in here in the US and around the world following the murder of George Floyd and beyond the immediacy of the, of the large protests and the kind of ways in which those grabbed headlines, I think there was a lot more happening behind the scenes or away from the headlines of the kinds of quiet introspection of people recognizing, oh, 
this isn't just about those people over there having racist thoughts or beliefs. It's about an entire structure that I'm complicit in or that I'm a beneficiary of. And so what does that mean for my own privilege? What does that mean for how I understand the world around me? And what is my responsibility to try to rectify those structures? And so we see that, again, here in the US, we see that with structures of oppression. We see that with um, the growing proliferation of land acknowledgments with regard to the US's own history of settler colonialism and uh, indigenous land theft and genocide of the Native Americans. So there's a growing awareness around structures of oppression and the ways in which historical events impact people today. And I think then when you turn to looking at how discussions around Palestine, Palestinians, Israel, Israelis are unfolding, we're seeing some of those same dynamics emerge where people are moving away from the very sort of 90s and, and kind of cringy framework of, oh, we just need to bring Israelis and Palestinians together, put them in a room, let them have dialogue. And once they all realize that they all love Hamas, everything's gonna be fine. And now more and more, I think people are realizing, no, that's not how this works. Not when there are these immense imbalances of power and these immense structural structures of oppression that those structures need to be analyzed and need to be dismantled in order for there to be any kind of resolution. So more, I think more and more people are moving away from uh, a kind of personal understand, uh, an understanding of conflict as being interpersonal and more and more moving to a framework of, um, a framework of structures of oppression, marginalization and so forth. So that's the exciting part. The cautionary note, however, that I think we also need to keep in mind is that, and we're again already seeing this in the US, is that there's a lot of pushback. And I think that there will continue to be a lot of pushback as people who uh, benefit from those structures of oppression become afraid that they will lose their privilege and they themselves will become the marginalized people. I remember in 2020, uh, there was a billboard that was put up somewhere in, in Arkansas, maybe I think it was in Arkansas, that had its 15 minutes of social media fame. And the billboard said, anti-racism is code for anti-white, something to that effect. And yeah, so it got its 15 minutes of fame. Everyone denounced it or loved it or what have you. It stuck with me because I think it encapsulates well a lot of the impasse that we're having right now. So anti-racism, the word racism in that phrase anti-racism is naming structures of oppression, a kind of web of structures of oppression, both historically and contemporaneously. But the second part of that is reading it as a personal attack against an, a, an identity, a group identity of white people. And so again, I think, sort of looking at the parallels in our current moment, as we discuss Palestine and Palestinians, I think that there are people who identify, for example, as anti-Zionist. In that phrase, when they say we're anti-Zionist, they're talking about Zionism as an ideology that underpins structures of oppression, Israeli state structures of oppression that privilege Jews over non-Jews in every facet of life, legally, culturally, you name it. Um, and those structures of oppression, I think, are what were named and, and documented in that Amnesty International report that came out a couple of weeks ago. But those who identify with Zionism and take that as part of their identity do see it as a personal attack and get very offended and get very upset and feel that they themselves, their identity, their, per their personhood is being attacked. And so the natural reaction when you think you're being personally attacked is to go on the offensive and to attack back and say, no, you're the racist and you're the one who's. So I think that's a lot of what we're seeing in this present moment in time. And so part of what I hope to do with this podcast, and I think part of what FMAP has been doing quite well over the last several years is trying to bring those conversations together and really highlighting what kinds of structures of oppression we're talking about, especially because those structures tend not to make headlines, right? We see the spectacular forms of violence. We see 
settlers and police and soldiers yanking Palestinians out of their homes. But there are all kinds of structures that impact Palestinians on a daily basis that never make the headlines, but are very much a part of the conversation that we need to have. Thank you. For all of that, for that, for the view, for the for, for starting with what is hopeful, which is feels so, un, feels so unusual, um, yeah. and 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 also very exciting, and um, and also I think one of the great gifts I uh, um, I'm I'm projecting, but from my own experience of being an educator is getting to actually see people change and and um, being close to what it looks like when people become aware of structures and of structures of oppression and that that awareness is always itself a point of of hopefulness and so i i, I love and appreciate that you started there and and i want to encourage everyone who everyone who feels despair to hold on to to that um to that possibility of 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 change and and of changing times so i thank you for that and I think just to build on that, as someone who's been in this, in this line of work, shall we say, for a good two decades now, this year alone, well, I guess last year now, so 2021, over the last few months, there have been so many, I'll call them serendipitous or coincidental, but I think they are part of a larger picture. So many serendipitous events of people who in the past were not interested or I would say maybe we're afraid of hearing Palestinian perspectives and voices have been reaching out to me and to others that I know who are like asking now. And so the first step is to, to want to know, to be curious enough to ask. And for those who have been taught their whole lives that Palestinians are a threat, that Palestinians are dangerous, that even the word Palestinian is somehow a threat, a threat to their own well-being, which is, I think, the case for a lot of people in the 70s and 80s and 90s. That very question of, I'd like to learn more, I'd like to hear from a Palestinian, or I'd like to hear a Palestinian perspective, is a huge leap. Those are, and I think I, I like to um, sort of give people credit for, for taking that first step. Um, I think there, there can be sometimes those of us who are um, working in Palestinian education and Palestinian advocacy, I think sometimes get impatient with people. We're like, come on, this is like, we were here a long time ago. You need to come over to the deep end where we are. The water is great here. Come join us. And there are still lots of people who are dipping their pinky toe in the water and kind of testing the waters. And I think we need to welcome them. I think we need to call them in and recognize them and bring them, bring them into the conversation and not, um, you know, not make them feel bad that they haven't been in the conversation already. That's beautiful. Thank you. So I, I have one, one last question for you. So, so given everything you just said about this moment and, and where we are, um, you're an FMEP fellow for this, for, for 2022. So I, how do you want to use this platform? What do you want FMEP's audiences to know and to be thinking about? So a lot, as you can imagine, but I think I'm going to, uh, we'll start with three, three things. So the first thing I want to do is bring some of this research and some of the research that my other fellow academics and um, activists and advocates are doing and bring it to a broader audience. Uh, a lot of people talk about academia and the university as an ivory tower. More and more, I'm thinking of it as a paywall, both in the literal sense of so much really interesting research and insights are being published in venues that are behind a literal paywall. And you have to either shell out a lot of money to access a single article, or you need to have institutional affiliation that has the database subscriptions that allows you to log in and get access to the article. And more and more, I'm, I'm not only uncomfortable, but, but upset by that, that so much richness and so much scholarship and so many insights are being limited to just a select number of people who have institutional affiliation at a time when that, those institutions are shrinking. Um, in terms of hiring academics and so forth. So the first thing I want to do is break that paywall and bring a lot of this scholarship to broader audiences. 
by inviting scholars, by inviting, um, by having podcasts with um, book authors and others who can share their research with the broader world. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to do, and this ties back to my current uh, book project, is to broaden our conversations about who the Palestinians are. So, so often in Western media discourse, the Palestinians are framed as primarily or solely as being in conflict with Israel. Sometimes they are displayed or they're talked about as victims of Israeli oppression and occupation and so forth. Sometimes, oftentimes, they are depicted as the villains in the story, as the antagonist to the you know, Israeli state defending itself. I want to move beyond this villain-victim dichotomy and talk about Palestinians on their own terms and move beyond just talking about them vis-a-vis -vis Israel or through their conflict with Israel, through Israel's oppression of them, and so forth. So that's going to mean having broader historical conversations. Who are the Palestinians and how did they come to be? I think it's a very, again, because I'm working on this book about it, I think it's a really fascinating story. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a clue, uh, we're not one people. We don't have a single lineage. We don't have a single bloodline. We don't descend from a single you know, patriarch or matriarch. We are a, a global people who have come from all over the world to this very special place. And we've gone from this very special place to all over the world. And so I wanna talk a lot about that and what that means for how Palestinians relate to Palestine. So I wanna broaden those discussions, but at the same time, I don't wanna lose sight of the, those very real and present dangers that Palestinians are facing. I don't want to gloss over the structures of oppression, marginalization, racism that they face in Israeli society and beyond. And so the third thing I want to do, I hope to do as a fellow, is to bring greater awareness to these various forms of structural violence, structural oppression, not only in Palestine or not only as Palestinians face them, but also, as I alluded to earlier, thinking about the parallels of structural violence, structures of oppression in the US, in, in other parts of the world with Palestine. So de-exceptionalizing, I think in some ways, the Palestinian condition, because the Palestinian condition ultimately is a condition of colonialism, settler colonialism, oppression, marginalization, and that's not unique to Palestinians. So to sum up, I think I wanna, I wanna use this fellowship and my time here as a fellow to reframe how we talk about Palestinians by centering Palestinian voices and perspectives and experiences. Wonderful. Well, I am very excited to listen to your podcasts and, and webinars and to continue to learn from you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I think it's gonna be a really wonderful experience. Me too, me too. And I'm excited for our audiences to get to keep learning from you and, and with you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us for this year. And thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into this episode of, of Occupied Thoughts. Please make sure to check out the FMEP website, www.fmep.org. And check it out to make sure, make sure that you are subscribed to this podcast so you can stay up to date and that you are Subscribe to our events list so that you can watch Maha and Jihad Abu Salim, our other 2022 inaugural fellow, with the programs that they are bringing to FMEP. You can find us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify, and you can also watch video versions of our podcasts, including this one, on YouTube. And with that, I am Sarah Ann Minkin, signing off until the next episode of Occupied Thoughts. <laughs>